So today we're going to be looking at the book of Ecclesiastes. So this is kind of a, uh, if you're not careful, you can kind of get like a, uh, a pessimistic outlook when we read Ecclesiastes. It's always, uh, it, was, it, was very, it was very cool to study and to kind of dive into Ecclesiastes. Man, just skimming the surface of it. I, I, didn't, I didn't even get deep, 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 deep into it as, as deep as I wanted to, but there's so much there in Ecclesiastes that we can just kind of read over it and see a guy uh, just that has this pessimistic outlook on, on life that Everything that we do is pointless. Uh, but what he's really doing all through the book of Ecclesiastes is telling this, this, this pr- the purpose of life, uh, what, we, what we are here for uh, in life. And so that's what we're going to tackle today, tonight, whenever you listen to this. But uh, we're going to tackle what is our purpose in life? What is our purpose? Oh, I'm sure many of you, uh, if not all of you, have heard the story of Adam and Eve uh, that we see in the very beginning in Genesis 1 through, uh, and especially in Genesis 3 where we see them rebel against God. But what we see in Genesis 1 is God creating everything from nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created from nothing. Uh, we see that He created it all good. It was, everything was perfect. And we see on the sixth day that, that God created man. He created Adam in his own image. And he created Eve in his own image. Um, and he, given, he gave them dominion over the earth. Everything that he created under the sun and on earth, on earth God had given Adam and Eve dominion. But then what we see, if we fast forward a little bit to Genesis 3, what we see is, is Adam and Eve rebelling against God and uh, disobeying the one command that God had given them, and that is to not eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet, uh, they were deceived, and then they rebelled. And so what happened next is God clothes them in His grace and His mercy, and that, but He casts them out of the Garden of Eden, east of Eden, uh, where, because sin cannot be in the presence of a holy God, and so what we have now is life east of Eden. It's fallen and it's cursed. Everything is, is affected in some way uh, by sin in the world. Uh, our relationship with each other is affected. Our relationship with nature itself, with animals around us and everything, it has been hindered. Just think about that for a moment. That was, that was Adam's job in the Garden of Eden, was to name the animals, to hang out with them. He could have rode on the back of a lion, for all we know, uh, and petted uh, the head of a T-Rex. So who knows what Adam did? He named them all. Uh, and so what we have now is a rebellious world, a sinful world, a, a cursed world, a world that is that's east of Eden. It's east of perfect. It's... it's um, it's a fallen world. In Romans 8, verses 20 and 21, Paul says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay and to the glorious freedom of God's children. So thus what we see is a repetitive cycle of life. We eat, we sleep, we work, we repeat. Uh, and, it's, and it's not easy. Life, life is not easy. So what's our purpose? If everything's kind of repetitive, uh, if, if, we, if we look, as Solomon says here in Ecclesiastes, like work's pointless, love's pointless, politics are pointless, everything in life is pointless, so what's the purpose? Um, and I believe he, he, what he's doing is, throughout all of Ecclesiastes, he's pointing out all these things are pointless, but they're pointless apart from God. But they have meaning and they have purpose. You have meaning, you have purpose when your life is surrendered to a holy God. So let's look at Ecclesiastes. Uh, we're going to look at verse or chapter 1 to begin with, verses 1 through 11. It says this, The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. So uh, most scholars, uh, and so Solomon's name is not actually mentioned throughout Ecclesiastes, but authorship is given to Solomon because... Uh, because of this right here, because of the statement, the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, 
Uh, but also, if you look throughout all of, of Ecclesiastes, you just see the wisdom from, from the teacher, or, or tr- another translation would read the preacher. Um, uh, you'll see just the wisdom and the references that he has to Proverbs uh, and everything. So authorship is given to Solomon, but he says in verse 2, absolute futility or vanities of vanity, says the teacher. Absolute futility, everything is futile. What does a person gain for all his efforts that he labors at under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets. Panting, it returns to the place where it rises. Gusting to the south, turning to the north, turning, turning goes the wind, and the wind returns in its cycles. All the streams flow to the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are wearisome, more than anyone can say. The eye is not satisfied by seeing or the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Can one say about anything, look, this is new. It has already existed in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of those who came before, and of those who will come after, there will also be no remembrance by those who follow them. Pray with me. Father, we love you. God, just give us wisdom as we dive into your word into Ecclesiastes, and we take a look at the meaning and the purpose of life. Um, Lord, I just pray that you would just teach us in your wisdom, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we see here is this first verse, is, or first point, is everything is a vapor. The word that we have here for, for futility, or some translations say vanity, literally means breath or vapor. It's, it's, it's beautiful, it takes different shapes and it takes different forms, but you, can't, you try to reach it and grasp for it, and yet it eludes you every time. Um, and it's almost like chasing, it's chasing a breath or chasing the wind. It's, it's, you can, you'll never be able to catch it. And so it's kind of, it's, it's, it's just saying life is, is, is a vapor, it's pointless, it's, it's a breath and it's gone. It's here, here today and gone tomorrow. The literal translation for us, it's probably best translated breath or vapor. So everything that we do is a mere vapor, is a mere breath. It's gone. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. What we do seems also to go nowhere. We, again, we live this repetitive life. So this is what Solomon is, 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 is wanting us to understand. But another phrase that we see, and we'll see this many times throughout uh, throughout the book of Ecclesiastes is this, under the sun, or sometimes they'll say under heaven. Um, what Solomon is doing here is posing the meaning of life from an earthly perspective. So he's, he's, he's asking the questions, if there is no God, if there is no afterlife, and if there is no final judgment, then everything that we do is pointless. So is there a purpose in life? That's the question that uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, I think, answers for us. Um, and, and then in Mark 8, 36, Jesus poses a similar question. He says, For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world, yet lose his life? What Solomon is doing here in Ecclesiastes is exposing any philosophy that seeks to live life apart or without God. So he's exposing that all these pursuits that we try to seek, that, that we, try to, we may try to seek in relationships, or we may try to seek in academics, or, 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 or sports, or, or anything that this world seems to offer us, is pointless, apart from God. These verses point out the repetitiveness of nature to prove that nothing is gained from all activity. Verse 4 shows the repetitive cycle of new generations. One generation dies, a new generation is born, and so on. We see this, a generation dies, a generation is born, a generation dies, a generation is born. So we see this cycle, and it just continues throughout, all, throughout generation after generation after generation. It's also crazy to think that the earth, which God created in the beginning for us, remember He submitted it to it, to, to Adam and Eve. He gave them dominion over the earth. Yet now, the earth continues on while generation after generation after generation dies off. And then Solomon gives us three examples from verses 
5 to, to 7 of, of just this repetitiveness and how life itself also kind of uh, reflects this as well for us. You see the sun, he uses the sun in verse 5, the sun rises and sets, panting, it returns to the place where it rises. So it's just talking about this repetitiveness of the, of the sun goes in circles to the wind. We see that it, it, it blows from east to west, north to south, and yet it returns to its same point. So it's got this repetitiveness of circling the world. And then we see oceans, which it also this, this statement kind of blows my mind in a way, but we see that all streams flow into the ocean, yet the ocean never changes. It never, it, it, we see the tide goes down and up. Yes, we do see that, but it never, it, never, it never overflows or fills the world till it's just to a point of just flooding. So the earth is caught up in this endless cycle and accomplishes nothing. And life, Solomon reflects, mirrors this, that what's the point in our life if it, it, under the sun in this earthly perspective again of looking at it from a, from a standpoint of if there is no, no God, no afterlife, no judgment, then what's the meaning of life? What's the point of life? So think about it for, min, uh, for this for a minute. How often are you faced with chores on a weekly basis? Um, so we got, well, do you mow, mow the yard? Do you fold clothes? Clean your room? Do you sweep or mop or vacuum? And then just when you think, man, I've finished everything that I've done, you're faced with it a week from, from that day, a few days later, or even the next day. All of that's piled back up waiting for you to do again. It's wearisome, more than anyone can say, as he says in verse 8. We never seem to be able to find contentment in life either. So we, we, ask, we, we say things like this to ourselves, if I can just get this degree, I'll be satisfied. If I can get this new car, I'll be satisfied. If I can just get married, I'll be satisfied. If I can get a house, I'll be satisfied. If we can have kids, I'll be satisfied. I'll be content with that, of that alone. But what we find out after saying these things, that there's always something else in life that we just say, if I could have this, I'll be satisfied. Which leads me to the second point that we see in verses 12 through 18. Nothing this world offers satisfies. Nothing in this world will satisfy us. Let's look at verse 12. It says, I, the teacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to examine and explore through wisdom all that is done under heaven. God has given people this miserable task to keep them occupied. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun, and I've found everything to be futile, a pursuit of the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, See, I've amassed wisdom far beyond all those who were over Jerusalem before before me, and my mind has thoroughly grasped wisdom and knowledge. I've, I applied my mind to know wisdom and knowledge, madness and folly. I learned that this too is a pursuit of the wind. For with much wisdom is much sorrow. As knowledge increases, grief increases. So what Solomon... This is also what leads scholars to believe that this is Solomon talking because he talks about applying wisdom, for seeking wisdom, finding it, and then applying it. Um, so he's, he's, he's essentially saying all these things we can pursue. We can pursue wisdom. We can pursue folly. That is, that is like uh, immorality, drunkenness, sin, sinful things, worldly things. We can pursue both spectrums. Wisdom, living a, wi a wise life. We can pursue folly, living just reckless. Yet done without God are pointless. Pleasure, wealth, materialism, work, politics, fame, power. He covers all this throughout, throughout Ecclesiastes. But yet what he says and what he finds himself is that nothing satisfies. Everything felt meaningless and pointless under the sun, under heaven. Nothing this world offers us will satisfy us apart from Christ. Which leads us to our final point, which is this. Purpose, purpose is found in Jesus. Verse, or if we flip all the way back to Ecclesiastes 12 and, and we look at verse 8 and following, it says, Absolute futility, says the teacher, everything is futile. And then verse 9, he says, In addition to the teacher being a wise man, he constantly taught the people knowledge. 
He weighed, explored, and arranged many proverbs. The teacher sought to find delightful sayings and write words of truth accurately. The sayings of the wise are like cattle prods, and those from masters of collections are like firmly embedded nails. The sayings are given by one shepherd. But beyond these, my son, be warned. There is no end to the making of many books, and much study wearies the body. When all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God and keep His commands, because this is for all humanity. For God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. Everything that we do apart from God is pointless. Everything that we do apart from God is pointless. So kind of what what Solomon is reflecting on here is Proverbs. All the Proverbs and the wise sayings that have been collected, that that he himself has written down, those done apart from God are pointless. Remember when we talked about how to be good at life, the first thing that we, we need to do to be good at life is to fear God. And part of fearing God is not wanting to displease Him, wanting to, to listen to what He has told us through His Word. So what we have here is a man who, is, who has lived a long life and he's reflecting on his life and he's, regret, he's, he's writing down things that, man, I wish I would have lived differently. So he's writing to his son in hopes that his son would see like, these are things that I did wrong. I, want, I don't want you to follow in these steps, but I want you to fear God, and I want you to, li- to keep His commands. Everything that we do apart from God is pointless. Looking for purpose in everything under the sun is ultimately pointless. And then he, he kind of, well, he, he compares the words uh, of the wise like cattle prods or, or goads, some of your translations may say, the purpose was to point, uh, or the purpose of, of a cattle prod or a goad was to point livestock in the right direction. It's to get them to go where the shepherd wants them to go. It's this, it's this picture also of, of, of a shepherd and his staff, and he's using that staff to guide his sheep to the green pastures. And so, Ecclesiastes does just that. What... what what Solomon wants us to know, what God wants us to, us to know is that all these things that the earth may offer us, these, these, un, these things under the sun uh, that promise life and promise joy are ultimately pointless apart from Him, apart from God. These words are given to us, as it says, given by one shepherd or given to us by the true shepherd, which was a reference to the coming Messiah. Uh, in Ecclesiastes, this was uh, a reference to Jesus. That, we, that was revealed to us in the New Testament portion of Scripture. Hebrews 1 says this, Long ago God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days He has spoken to us by His Son. God has appointed Him heir of all things and made the universe through Him. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact rep- expression of His nature, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. After making purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand, of the majesty on high. So our ultimate purpose is in life is for us to do everything, uh, everything, uh, not, not apart from God, but to do everything with God, walking with God alongside of us. Whether we work, what, whatever job we're in, uh, if, whether we're in school, whether we're just cleaning dishes at home, whether we're taking care of our children, whatever that may be, we do it all for His glory. That is our purpose in life. Our purpose in life is to fear God and keep His commands. The life, this life is preparing us for a future life. This life is, is the rehearsal for a life that we are going to have in the new heaven and the new earth that's going to be perfect, that's not going to be affected with sin, that, our, that, that it, the jobs God gives us are going, are going to be ultimate joy, whatever that, whatever that is. This life has purpose because we are looking forward to a perfect and everlasting kingdom. When we align our lives to this truth, then everything that we do has purpose. When we align ourselves to this, this truth that, that there is a future home for us, this life we're living now is, is prep, in preparation for that. You can see that Peter talks about that in 1 Peter. Um, but everything that we do in this life has purpose now. Because of Jesus, Scripture tells us to do all things for the glory of God. No longer are those small chores that we have around the house pointless, but they have purpose. 
because if you're sm- if you're faithful in small things, then you will be you will be given greater responsibilities in the kingdom of God here on earth. You can love with purpose. You you, you can parent with purpose. You can work with purpose. You can pursue de- your degree with purpose. You can build relationships with purpose. You can live life with purpose because of Jesus. Which leads me to this statement. Uh, is that Yes, uh, we talked about God creating, God creating this world that's perfect, man messing it up, bringing sin, and, and this, this curse that affects everything on earth uh, from, in every generation, uh, from, from Adam and Eve to the very end. Uh, and, and then we know that God sent His Son, Jesus, to, to, to live a perfect life for us, because we can't, to die a death for us, to be buried, to raise on the third day, to ascend to the seat at the right hand of the Father, to all who call on His name will be saved, Scripture tells us, that all who believe in the heart, confess with their mouth, will be saved. It's not, it's not that we have to earn it, or we have to, 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 to do something in order to gain this salvation. All we have to do is believe. We have to accept this, this truth that God has done it for us. That God has given us grace through Jesus, and if we call on the name of Jesus, we will be saved. And so when we pray, and, we, and, and, and you've never given your life to Jesus, you, you admit that you're a sinner, and that you need salvation. You believe that, that Jesus has done these very things for you, that He, he lived a perfect life, He died your, in your place, and He rose on the third day. You believe these things, you, you are saved. But it doesn't stop there. We, can, we have to work out our, our, our salvation in fear and trembling. We've, we've also got to pursue, uh, pursue a relationship with Jesus. Yes, Jesus has saved us. He has given us a new heart. He's sent a spirit to live inside of us. And now we've we got to do our work where we, we, uh, we, we live obediently, him, obediently to Him. That's fear, fear in God and keeping His commandments. So I think... What Solomon is doing here in, in Ecclesiastes is this very, very truth that, that we can pursue anything on earth, find temporary enjoyment, yes, enjoyment, uh, find temporary joy, but everything that we pursue apart from, from God is pointless. Even, even Christians can fall into this thing. Here's, here's a man, Solomon, who, who believed God, but yet he started, he, he, he started pursuing other things. Here's a guy who had 700 wives and, and 300 concubines, 1,000 wives, and yet he was never, never, never fulfilled. He was never satisfied. He had all, everything that money could buy, and yet he was never fully satisfied. So if there's anyone on earth that can tell us these things, it would be Solomon, a man who, could have, who, who, who knew it all and could have it all. Yet he, he, he realized that everything was pointless without Jesus. Everything was pointless without God. So our purpose in life is to fear God, to keep His commands. It's, it's, to, it's to live our life in relationship with Jesus. That everything that we do, whether, wherever God calls you in life, we do it for the glory of His name. That is our purpose in life. So good, so glad you could join, join us this evening. Um, if, you need, if you made a decision to follow Jesus, we would, like, we would like to know. We'd like to follow up with you. You can contact our office uh, and talk to one of the ministers, or you can go to our webpage, fbcsumrall.org, and scroll to the very bottom and, and click on our contact form, and you can fill that out, and our minister will, uh, will contact you and, and, and either let you know how to have a relationship with Jesus and to pray with and to celebrate your decision to follow Jesus. We're praying for you, church family, uh, and we can't wait to see you again.